In this video, I'll discuss asset access control. The goal of access control is to identify users, services, or devices and limit their access to resources. So we can use Identity and Access Management, or IAM, where we might build users and groups and determine what resources they have access to. This will allow us to secure access to cloud-hosted applications, resources, and data assets. We can build unified access control policies for both cloud as well as local network applications that we still might be running on premises. This ensures an efficient management of identity creation and destruction, such as the creation of user accounts and the removal of them when no longer required. Another goal of access control is to avoid the use of multiple authentication mechanisms specifically multiple identity stores. We don't want to have a directory service that contains user credentials on premises as well as with each specific cloud application. Instead, we want a single unified identity provider so that's easier for management and it scales well. And after people are authenticated to that centralized identity provider, then they would be authorized to use a wide array of services. Access to resources can be managed via federation. Federation allows us to use a central identity store that is trusted by multiple applications. This way, we avoid having multiple identity stores. It also lends itself to single sign-on or SSO. What this means is that instead of the user being prompted to authenticate every time they access a cloud service, as long as they've authenticated once, and their session hasn't timed out, they'll be seamlessly taken into what they're trying to access. This can also be done via the cloud service provider management solution. Federation uses what are called claims. A claim is basically a statement about something or someone. For example, for a user that authenticates, a claim might be such that this user has this specific email address, they are a member of groups one and two, and here is their date of birth. Those would be claims. Now, claims-based identity can be integrated with existing internal security frameworks. For example, if we're using Active Directory on our network, then we could integrate it with the identity management solution provided by a cloud service provider so that claims can be constructed. And this is relevant because those claims are consumed in some cases by cloud applications. So claims or applications can authenticate users inside or even outside of a corporate firewall. It's not limited to a single organization. Federation utilizes a security token service or STS to create a SAML ticket to present to a token aware cloud based application. Think of it kind of like going to an amusement park and being issued a ticket for a ride and then presenting that ticket when you want to get on the ride. That's the same type of thing here. Once you get your SAML ticket issued, you then present it to various applications and through single sign-on, you will not be prompted to authenticate again. Instead, they authorize you to use those applications. Cloud providers maintain the security token service to allow claim-based access to their applications after a trust relationship is established with your in-house identity system. For example, Microsoft Active Directory. So there's some procedure, and it may vary from cloud provider to cloud provider, whereby the cloud provider needs to trust your list of user accounts if you've got it on premises. This could be done by supplying a public key if you're using PKI, public key infrastructure, or you might install a specified agent on your Active Directory server, for example, so that it is trusted by the cloud provider. Single sign-on and single sign-off allow the user to log in once to gain access to one or more software systems without being prompted to log in again. This is often a result of some kind of token or ticket exchange using SAML, the Security Assertion Markup Language. Most Identity Federation solutions will support the SAML standard. Single sign-on and sign-off also supports the enforcement of enterprise authentication and authorization policies. Access control could be the responsibility of the cloud service consumer or the cloud service provider or both. 
In some cases, a cloud service consumer or customer might not have user accounts and groups created on premises, such as in Active Directory. They might completely rely on the cloud service provider solution, so they would register user accounts entirely in the cloud. Now we do have the option of integrating this type of IAM solution. IAM stands for Identity and Access Management with something we have on premises like Active Directory. This way, we could define policies related to password change, password complexity architecture, and so on. We should also consider secure data deletion when we change different cloud service providers. We might decide, for example, to end our business relationship with one cloud provider and move to another. We want to make sure that if we had our user accounts stored with the other cloud provider or replicated from our on-premises systems, we want to make sure that those are securely removed. We should also consider general security attack and security breaches that might take place. For example, we might decide that we're going to enable multi-factor authentication for our users so that it's harder to crack from a hacker perspective. Many cloud service providers will allow you to integrate a directory service in the cloud with your on-premises directory service or to completely host a directory service entirely in the cloud. For example, here we could connect to our active directory on-premises environment or we could create an active directory configuration entirely in the cloud. Now at the same time, if we just want a simple list of user accounts, we might go instead into an identity and access management solution offered by the provider where we could build users, we could build groups and add users to the groups and build policies to control what is allowed to be done by the users. Let's take a look at the traffic flow that's related to Identity Federation. In step one, we see here on the left, the user would log on to Active Directory and get their Kerberos ticket. In step two, the user would then attempt to establish a session with a web app. In step number three, the app would need a session or a token that is trusted. And if it doesn't have one from the user, then it will redirect the user's station to the security token service of the relying party. Now, the relying party is the party that actually hosts apps. And the relying party needs to trust an identity provider elsewhere. In step four, the relying party's security token service would send a token request to the identity provider security token service. Now, this could be within a single organization or it could be between two different organizations. For example, your on-premises active directory environment could be the identity provider, whereas the relying party might be the cloud provider. Either way, in step four, the request is sent to the identity provider if the user wasn't already authenticated. In step five, the security token service authenticates user information, in this case from Active Directory, and then creates a SAML token. Now the SAML token is where the claims come in. Perhaps the application needs to see a date of birth or group membership or an email address or anything like that. That means that we'd have to configure our identity provider security token service to put that claim information into the SAML token. In step six, the Identity Provider Security Token Service redirects the user back to the Relying Party Security Token Service with the SAML token. Now, the Relying Party, remember, is where the application is hosted that the user is trying to get into in the first place. In Step 7, the Security Token Service will redirect the user back to the app with either a created session or a token. Finally, in the eighth step, the user is authenticated in the application and can work with the content. Now, the user will not see this happening, and it happens very quickly. In this video, we discussed asset access control.